Welcome everybody to this very, very special 5x15 event. There is so much happening in the world right now and we're so honoured to have this extraordinary group of speakers here with us this evening, joining us from all over the world to talk about many of the themes and things that are affecting us all right now, from the twilight of democracy to the unravelling of an American era to the lonely century mastering uh, the, the poker table and unraveling the secrets hidden deep within our bones. And we do have some of our all time favorite five by 15 speakers with us this evening. So we are in for a treat and I hope it will be entertaining and inspiring and thought provoking and you know, just take us away from all of the things that are preoccupying us right now. So for the next hour and 15 minutes, um, let's tune in and enjoy this extraordinary lineup of speakers. Please tweet us at 5 by 15 stories and look out for the book details in the chat. All of our speakers have fantastic books and they are available if you're in the UK from our book part partner New and Books and we'll put the details in the chat and in the follow-up email tomorrow. So our first speaker this evening is Norena Hertz. And even before the global pandemic introduced us to terms like social distancing, Norena was re really researching loneliness and her research has taken her all over the world to Japan where she's investigated robot caregivers to lock down uh, remote workers in London. And um, the most important thing I think about this book is that it offers us solutions. It offers us an insight into how we can try to turn the tide on this loneliness epidemic. And I think it is incredibly timely and almost prophetic that she has been doing this work for so long. And it is an honor to have her with us. She's an economist and I am going to hand over to her. Uh, welcome, Norena. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. When I think about what I've missed most in recent weeks and months, it hasn't been clothes shopping or traveling or getting my hair done, not that there haven't been times when it's really needed doing. It's been something much more fundamental. Hugs from friends, chats with the servers at my local cafe, that empathetic glance from a fellow gym goer at that point we've both been feeling the burn. As humans, our need to connect with others is hardwired, originating in our deep evolutionary past. We are what we might think of as creatures of togetherness. Being connected to others is our natural and in fact desired state, whether this desire is conscious or not, which is why feeling disconnected from others feels so awful. For it's a sensation our bodies have been primed to react strongly against. You see, when we're lonely, our blood pressure, cortisol levels and cholesterol all rise steeply. The part of our brain responsible for fight or flight, our amygdala, goes into a state of high alert, a smart short term response for sure, reminding us clearly of the importance of reconnecting to others. But a response that when protracted, like keeping a car in first gear over the course of a journey, isn't good for us physically as well as mentally, and helps explain why loneliness isn't just linked to depression and anxiety, but also decreases our life expectancy. Loneliness is as damaging to our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, with even relatively short periods of isolation capable of having a significant negative impact. Now, what's important to acknowledge is that whilst recent weeks and months have made many of us feel more isolated. Even before terms like social distancing had entered our vocabulary and our smiles were occluded by masks, this already was the lonely century, a world in which we felt ever more distant from each other and ever more apart. A world in which four in 10 under 25s said that they often or always felt lonely. Two in five pensioners admitted that their main form of company was their television or pet. Almost half of those who work in offices didn't have a single friend at their job and 85% of employees felt disconnected from their company and their work. Even before the coronavirus struck, we'd been for some time already in the midst of a global loneliness crisis, a 
a crisis that was affecting all of us, young and old, male and female, married and single, rich and poor. In fact, as I crisscrossed the globe, researching my new book, The Lonely Century, one of the things that struck me was how huge the range of people profoundly affected by feelings of disconnection and isolation was. Whether I'm talking Saito San, the Tokyo pensioner who chose a life of crime in order to be incarcerated because jail was the only place she could fill into company. Hashim, the London Uber driver, who despite being with passengers all day long feels desperately lonely because he's too scared to speak to them in case he's rated badly as a result. Eric, the Parisian baker, who tells me how isolated he was until he found community in France's far right. Peter, the London schoolboy, who shared how invisible it makes him feel when he posts on Instagram and gets no response. Or Carl, the Los Angeles media executive, who is so lonely he pays to be cuddled. Some of these may be extreme cases for sure, but the fact is loneliness has been on the rise throughout this century, affecting so many of us. There are many reasons why loneliness has been increasing. The unprecedented pace of contemporary life, an ever more feral workplace, a rise in numbers of people who live on their own, mass migration to cities, these are just some of the contributory factors. Did you know that not only is civility lower in cities, but also that the more densely populated a city, the less civil it is, or that the richer a city, the faster its inhabitants walk, rushing past each other, slamming doors in each other's faces, typically not even knowing our neighbors' names. No wonder cities feel so lonely to so many. The workplace, well, even before working from home was the norm, work was for many lonely. In open plan offices, people counterintuitively are more likely to communicate by email rather than talk to each other face to face. Whilst radical changes to the way work is structured have resulted in increasing numbers of people in low paid, low quality, precarious work, feeling increasingly disenfranchised and without voice. Then there are of course the choices politicians have made. Think, for example, of how, ever since the 2008 financial crisis, places where people can come together, libraries, parks, youth centres, community centres, have been starved of funds. 130 libraries were shut down in the UK last year alone. Community needs an infrastructure. Physical spaces where people of all kinds can interact with each other, unite we'll never be able to find common ground if there is no ground we can share. And of course, there's this device. The weapon of mass distraction that fragments our attention, making the world a meaner, crueler place, and also is radically changing how we interact. Fascinating research done in America found that people smile significantly less at each other when they have their smartphones with them, just with them, not necessarily turned on. And despite having spent a number of years researching today's teenagers, I have to admit, I was pretty shocked when I discovered that one of America's most prestigious Ivy League universities has started to run a how to read a face in real life class for its incoming students, in which they're taught if somebody smiles in a meeting, that's a good sign, frowns, that's bad, because so many of their incoming students, having spent so much time on their screens, were incapable of communicating effectively in person. Big tech, big corporations and governments clearly have much to answer for, and there are tangible steps they must take if we are to be able to reconnect. My new book, The Lonely Century, has many ideas on this front as to what it is they can do. But there's also much we can do because society is not only done to us, we do society too. So if we are to stem the loneliness crisis and rebuild community, we will need to actively tend it. Each of us needs to take responsibility for the kind of world in which we want to live whilst recognizing that the cards we have been dealt economically and socially 
may well impact the extent to which we are able to do so. Some of this is about taking small steps that may not seem much at first glance, but over time will accrue meaningful impact. Things like putting our phones away and being more present with our partners and families. Asking a work colleague who always eats their lunch alone, Aldesco, whether they want to join us for lunch, even virtually for now. Smiling at those who pass by us as we walk in the park, and if we've got masks on, nodding or waving, explicitly recognising a colleague's or friend's helpfulness or kindness. Other steps will demand more of us. Whether it's campaigning for a political candidate who speaks to cohesion, not division, standing in solidarity with a group that's being unfairly demonised or discriminated against, or weaning ourselves off these digital transactions we found so convenient during lockdown, committing instead to buy more at our local shops and support the business owners who serve and anchor our communities. More generally, it's a shift in mindset that's needed. We need to recast ourselves from consumers to citizens, from takers to givers, from casual observers to active participants, this is about taking opportunities to exercise our listening skills, whether in the context of work, our family lives, or in our friendships. It's about accepting that sometimes what's best for the collective is not what's in our own immediate self-interest. It's about actively practicing empathy, something in the cut and thrust of daily life we can easily forget to do. And while some may decry calls for a greater focus on softer value, we also need to commit to consideration for others being our lodestar, drawing inspiration from the selfless acts of many people across the globe during the heights of the pandemic. Whether we're talking about the Midlands volunteer who searched high and low during lockdown until he found a shop selling milk in glass bottles in order to support a blind man who needed them to tell the difference between different liquids in his fridge, the Italian university students who left a note in the stairwell of their apartment block offering to help the building's elderly residents with grocery shopping and other tasks. Or the Arkansas teenager who poignantly explained that although he hadn't been able to do too many things for people during lockdown, he'd been trying to make an effort to talk to people I don't normally talk with, just offering a fun conversation to distract them from the world which speaks to something each of us can do, something we can do right now. Think about whether there's someone in our own network who might be lonely and consciously reach out to them. If we can, arrange to meet up with them in a socially distanced, safe way, or otherwise pick up the phone and give them a call. Just sewing someone with thinking about them, that they are visible to us, can make a huge difference to someone who's feeling lonely themselves. Kindness matters. Feeling heard and seen matters. Feeling connected to others matters. And although this right now is the lonely century, it doesn't have to remain so. Change is possible as long as the will is there, individually and collectively. The future is in our hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norena. That was so inspiring. What a brilliant start to this, this evening and also speaks a lot to, you know, some of the things that we try to do with 5 by 15 in terms of connecting with people and reaching out and listening to new perspectives and just, you know, discovering something different. Thank you so, so much for being part of it. And The Lonely Century is out now and it is an extraordinary book. So I hope that you will all pick up a copy if you haven't got one already. Thank you for being part of this, Norena. Um, and next up, we have Dane Professor Sue Black, who has actually spoken at 5 by 15 twice before, and she is a fantastic speaker. She's a world-renowned forensic anthropologist, and she's author of the Sunday Times best-selling book, All That Remains. 
Sue's new book is called Written in Bone, and it reveals the secrets that can be found deep within our bones, hidden right inside us. And it draws on a wealth of remarkable experience from Sue's life and her career, and also her amazing, amazing storytelling capacity, which we have been so lucky to benefit from at Five by 15. So Sue, um, welcome back. And thank you very, very much for joining us again. Oh, thank you, Daisy. You are so very kind and it is always a pleasure to see you. I have no idea how I'm supposed to follow <laughs> on from Narina. That was the most amazing uh, presentation that she gave and so poignant, so important that it almost feels that what I have to say is, is kind of irrelevant almost. It's a little bit of, um, I'd like to say light relief, but my life as an anatomist and a forensic anthropologist isn't often viewed by many as being light relief. And as you've said very kindly, this is the second book that I've written in this sort of genre, which is looking at the, the interaction between every normal day life for me, but also my profession, which is really rather unusual for most people. With Written in Bone, what I wanted to do, because I, I believe as an anatomist and a forensic anthropologist, often we have very little lexicon about our own body, very little understanding of where our different bits are. And so part of what I wanted to do as an expert witness in the court is to talk to the public about themselves, making them think about their own bodies. And let's face it, in a time where we're locked down with not an awful lot to do, the exercises that we do of our mind as well as our body become incredibly important. But for those of you who are overseas, what I'm going to say next probably won't make much sense. But for those of you in the UK who are at least my age, it will. In the, in the 1970s, we had a television program, a truly dreadful television program, which was called The Generation Game. And it was run by a host who was called Bruce Forsyth. And one of the, the games that they used to play was they would put out an outline of the human body and the contestants had to draw in where they would find their liver or their stomach or their kidneys. And it was amazing to me as an anatomist just how little we know about our own bodies. And certainly if you go into a GP or you speak to somebody who's come out of a GP or the hospital and you say, what did they tell you? Often what patients will say is, I don't really know because I didn't understand. And much of that lack of understanding is simply because we have that difference in a lexicon. We have a slightly different language going on in a medical phase than we have in our normal public life. So what I wanted to do was to bring the body into people's vision, to use all the right words, but to use it in a way that helps us to understand our body, perhaps just that little bit better. One of my areas of expertise is in criminal dismemberment. And what I mean by that is it's my job when a body is, is placed into parts to be able to determine what sort of implement might have been used to put that body into parts, whether the individual was lying face down or on their back, which limb was removed first. And all of that means that we know frequently in terms of our cases that we won't always find a complete body. So the purpose of the book, in my background, my head, was to say, I want to talk about anatomy and forensic anthropology, but I want to do it in a way that is straightforward to understand. And I'm going to use the concept of criminal dismemberment. So I'm going to take each section of the body and I'm going to look at it in isolation, whether that's the head or it's the limbs or it's the hands, it's the feet. And in looking at that particular part of the body in quite a detailed lens in some parts, what I'm also going to do is show you how certain cases that I've worked on in the past, that area of the body is particularly relevant to what we're looking at. And it may have been that it was that part of the body that helped to unravel the mystery or the crime. It was that part that helped to solve it, or perhaps it was the only part of a body that we were able to identify. Now, not knowing my audience, normally you can look out across the sea and you can see the audience and you know how people are responding to you. And it's a really alien environment to be in front of a screen, not able to see anybody else's faces, because you can usually judge when you've gone a little bit too far in the field of forensic anthropology. So I thought what I would do is I'd choose a section of the book tonight that we're all comfortable with. 
And we're all comfortable with two parts of our bodies because of the parts of our bodies that we're prepared to show everybody on a daily basis. It's either our face or it's our hands. So I thought, well, I'll look at something from the hands section of the book. But then what I'll do is I won't use anything that is too difficult because I don't know the age of my audience and I can't look you in the eye. So I'm going to just give a little bit of a background on one of the cases that will give you some of the idea of the kinds of things that I looked at. And usually what happens is that a police investigation for me starts with a phone call. And it's a phone call that comes through to my secretary and she says, I've got a police force on the phone for you. And you never know what that's going to turn into. And interestingly, a number of police forces often start with, I know this is a little bit strange. And at the end of the day, we have seen the most ludicrous and ridiculous cases that you couldn't even possibly imagine as a crime fiction writer, because much more often, actually fact is much stranger than fiction. So I had a phone call one day and Daisy's going to find a slide for me, I hope, which she's going to be able to put up on the screen for you. And the police turned up with a little evidence bag and inside the evidence bag, they had this. And what the police were dreadfully hoping for was that this was going to be something that was a joke. It was something from a Halloween. It was not going to be anything for them to investigate. Well, that was the point at which we burst their bubble. So this is a key fob, obviously, but it's a key fob of considerable difference because this is the distal, the middle, and part of the proximal phalanx of a right index finger. Now, the first thing the police want to know is, is this human? And unquestionably, this is human, because there is no animal where the, the digits look exactly like this and in that order, because they fit together. They're from the same individual. When you look at primate hands, primate hands can look very similar, but they are still different to the human. So we know that this is human. Is it forensic, they asked, or is it archeological? Well, it hasn't been buried because it doesn't have the dark coloration that you normally get associated with bone that's being buried. So we were pretty sure that it was probably going to be relatively recent. We can measure some of the bones and it tells us that it's come from an individual who was most likely to be male. And when we take an X-ray of it, what we can see at the ends of the bone are little growth plates that have only just finished growing. And so if this is male, then it's going to come from somebody who's probably around 16 to 18 years of age. Now, because you have that finger, doesn't mean that the individual is dead. Of course, as you know, you can have an amputation and survive quite readily. So what the police did was they'd found this, a walker um, out with a dog, as always people walking dogs, had found this and brought it into the police station. And I said, what you really need to do is you need to go around door to door and you need to find a young man who's missing his left index finger. Now, if you can't find that, then maybe we're going to have to look at something a little bit more nefarious that's been going on. But the chances are there's going to be somebody around there who doesn't have a finger. And of course, they knock on the door and a young man opens the door and his name is David. And wonderfully, he's missing the index finger on his hand. And he admits that, in fact, the key fob is his. Now, that should be the end of it. But what's really interesting is to say, well, why have we got a key fob that has a finger on it? And this is where so often the fact of what we see in a police case is so much more ridiculous than any fiction. Obviously, there's no crime to investigate, but let me tell you what happened. He was a 16 year old boy at the time. He's now a 23 year old man. And as a 16 year old boy, he worked for his father um, in his carpenter shop. And he was in a hurry one day whilst he was cutting wood and he didn't put all the necessary safety guards that he should have done onto the bandsaw, a circular saw that he was using. And he literally amputated by accident his own finger. He was taken to A&E and at A&E, he somehow managed to persuade them to allow him to keep his own finger. Now, there is no law against that. I don't know that it's necessarily something that you should advocate that anybody should do, but he was allowed to keep his finger. So he took home his finger and he decided and knew that he couldn't keep it forever because it was going to go off. So he thought, well, what I'll do is I'll do what my mum does. She puts bones into water and boils them when she's making soup. So if I boil my finger, 
then I can get rid of all the soft tissue and I'll just have the bones left. And for a 16 year old, that apparently seemed to be cool. So he boiled his finger and he laid it out on some, some toweling and he noticed that it wasn't, still wasn't smelling very nice after a few days and it was still oozing a little bit of fat. So he then knew that when his mother um, had oils or fat that she needed to get of clothing, what she did, she boiled it with some detergent. So he popped his finger bones back into a pan with some detergent and boiled them up again. And then he thought to get them a little bit cleaner, he would drop them into bleach, into household bleach, because he knew that made things white. Isn't it wonderful that you can think about so many things that go on in a normal moment in life and relate it back to something unusual like this? So he then took his finger bones and he put them on a paper towel on his windowsill and he let them dry in the sun for a number of weeks. They were perfectly dry. He didn't know what to do with them. So he popped them in a little glass vial and he left them there. And every now and again on things like Halloween, he'd take them out because he thought it was a bit cool to show his friends down in the bar that these were his, his finger bones. But he then decided that he wanted to make some jewelry out of his own finger bones and he made them into the key fob that you just saw. Now, all of that is weird enough, but then he did something that went too far. He decided that this would make a wonderful Valentine's Day present for his girlfriend. I think she was probably expecting diamonds or she was expecting roses, but what she got was a fob made out of his finger bones. I think she, at that point, took great umbrage. It was probably the end of their entire relationship and she threw it away. And at that point, he was distraught. He'd lost his finger. She'd thrown it away only for it to be found by a dog walker and then found and taken by the police to a forensic anthropologist before it could get back to him. Now, if you put that in crime fiction, nobody would believe you. But the world of anatomy and the world of forensic anthropology is a strange place. And we need to be able to interpret any part of the human body that we find with the maximum amount of detail. So whilst his finger and his finger bones forever will remain at 16 years of age, as he gets older, the only thing we can hope for is that perhaps he will gain a little bit more sense. And in future, when he buys Valentine's presents for his wife or his girlfriend or whoever it may be, that perhaps he develops a little bit more taste. So at the end of the book, what I really want everybody to do is to feel comfortable about talking about their own body parts, about the variation in it, the wonderful variation that is the human body. And sometimes to take the cases very seriously, but sometimes, like David with his missing finger, to really enjoy the ludicrous nature that is the human being. Thank you, Daisy. So thank you so much. That was so amazing and really um, not what I was expecting the end of that story to be at all. What a gift, what a present. I mean, very, very romantic. No. So thank you. Thank you for being part of 5 by 15 again and for your amazing work, which is so, you know, inspiring to all of us. And thank you for talking to us about it with such clarity and such um, great kind of language and communication that makes it understandable to all of us. Um, we're really thrilled that we had you with us again and um, enjoy the rest of your lockdown in Scotland. I will. Thank you so much, Daisy. Thank, thank you. you See you again soon. Um, now we are going to introduce Anne Applebaum, and it is a great honour for us to have her with us this evening. She's a staff writer at The Atlantic and a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, and she's a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins School of International Advanced International Studies, which is where I studied, and she co-directs a programme on disinformation and propaganda. Um, her new book is called Twilight of Democracy, which explains with electrifying clarity why some people, some countries around the world, are abandoning liberal democratic ideals in favour of strongmen cults. And the reviews have been absolutely incredible. And it is an incredibly timely book. So we are very, very honoured to have you with us here this evening. And thank you very much for finding the time to be part of 5 by 15 and over to you. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to start 
um, by telling you what happened to me on the morning of April 10th, 2010. Uh, I was in New York City um, and it was, it was morning. Uh, my husband was then in Poland. He was the Polish foreign minister. I was in New York on business. Um, and I picked up the phone and called him. And I thought, you know, it was a jolly morning. I said, how are you? Uh, and he picked up the phone and he said, I'm not well. And I said, what's wrong? And he told me that there had been a terrible plane crash in Poland that day, um, a plane crash that had killed 96 people. Um, among them were members of parliament, officials, members of the government, senior military figures, his deputy, um, a close friend of his, um, and above all, the president of Poland and his wife and his entourage were all on the plane. Uh, the plane had been flying from, it flew that, had flown that morning from Warsaw to Smolensk. Um, Smolensk is a town in Russia, and it's a town that's very near an important Polish war memorial. Uh, it's a memorial to Poles who were killed during the war by, um, by the Soviet Union. It was a terrible massacre. Um, it was a massacre of officers. It was then covered up. Um, and it was, it's been a, a sore point in Polish history for many years. But the plane, and then the plane had been taking the president who'd been planning to lay flowers on at the, at the memorial and had then been planning to use that as the start of his presidential campaign. He was then due for reelection. Um, in Poland, the president is from a different political party from the government sometimes. And in this case, he was. Um, my husband was in a center right party. The president was in a more um, the kind of nationalist right party. Nevertheless, after the plane crash happened, um, I, I quickly, I went back to Poland. Um, there was this feeling of um, emotional, deep and powerful national unity. You know, all kinds of people had been on the plane. There were stewardesses, there were bodyguards, there were people from every political party. Um, in the days that followed, there were funerals all over the country. I went to several of them. Um, I also went one evening out to the airport when they, as they brought, um, they brought coffins back from Russia to Poland um, and the army stood at attention and military bands played. Um, it was, for some reason, it was a very cold spring um, and we all remember it being um, somehow standing in the cold at the airport as a, as a very painful and difficult moment. Um, it also felt like a moment when you know, Poland had, has, has been a divided and, you know, diff country, po politics can be very difficult there. But this felt like something that pulled people together. And also, it was very clear from the very beginning what had happened. Um, and as the investigations of the crash began, it became clearer and clearer. Um, and one of the assumptions that I made was that, well, we, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a moment we have forensic science of the kind that we've just been hearing about on this on this, um, you know, it, fr from the previous speaker, um, we, we can find out what happened. Um, you know, this is a tragedy and it's a strange tragedy. It's an eerie tragedy. But what happened was that the pilots uh, were landing in, a, it wasn't really an airport. It was an airstrip in the forest. There was thick fog. Um, they misread some, some instruments. They hit a tree and the plane crashed. And that's, that's the story. And there will be no conspiracy theories around this. Um, everybody agrees upon what happened. As the weeks and months went by though, the story began to shift and change. Um, and the president's brother, who was um, his twin and who was also the leader of his political party, um, having initially accepted the explanation that there was an accident, began to change the story. He began to insinuate that it wasn't an accident, there was a conspiracy. He never really explained what the conspiracy was, but maybe the Russians were responsible. Maybe there was a, maybe somehow the government was responsible. That, that's the government that was not the same political party. Maybe something else had happened. Um, people around him began to, began to write stories and articles speculating about what had happened. They had no evidence. Um, nevertheless, they invented stories. They did mock-ups on the covers of magazines showing exploding planes. Um, they, uh, that, you know, they, 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 they wrote, they, they looked for alternative experts. So they found somebody in America who came and said, I know about airplanes and this could never happen. And it turned out he was a, he was at a small university. He knew nothing about this kind of air crash or these kinds of situations. Nevertheless, they made him into a kind of hero. 
um, they found other kinds of experts. They found musicologists who said that the the, 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 the noise on the black boxes didn't sound right um, that was, as, the, as the tapes were played. Um, and they gradually created a sense among a large part of the public, and, and we underestimated this at the time, it began to be 20%, then it was 25%, then it was 30% of the public, slowly became convinced that something had happened, that this couldn't have just been an accident, that such a momentous event couldn't have taken place unless there was a plot, unless there was a plan, um, unless something nefarious had happened. Sounds like a strange story. It's amazingly similar. It's amazingly similar to what Donald Trump did as he entered US politics in 2015, 2014, 2015, and then 2016. He too entered politics by saying, there's been a conspiracy. Something terrible has happened and, and your government and your media and your politicians are all hiding the truth from you. And of course the conspiracy was different in this case. The conspiracy in this case was that President Barack Obama was not really American. Really he was born abroad, he was born in Africa. Um, he had, he, and he was not a legitimate president. And Donald Trump repeated this. He asked questions about it. He said, where is, Donald, where is, where is Obama's birth certificate? Um, Obama did have a birth certificate, which was produced. Where's the long form birth certificate? Um, that was eventually produced too. Um, there, are, there were newspapers printed in Hawaii on the day of Obama's birth that, that mentioned his name. This was dismissed as, as something impossible. And while he, was, while he began, he was out of office initially, but every time he appeared on television, every time he could, Donald Trump brought up this theory over and over again. Barack Obama is not a legitimate president. Both of these two conspiracy theories, um, both underestimated initially, turned out to be incredibly powerful and important. Um, in Poland, the president's twin brother, whose name is Jarosław Kaczynski, um, who's still now the leader of the Polish ruling party, rode this conspiracy party, conspiracy theory um, to victory in an election in 2015. Um, Donald Trump rode this same conspiracy to, you know, so, sorry, rode his a different conspiracy um, to election in 2016. Um, both of them have things in common. Um, um, you know, in both cases, it's not clear whether the person pushing the conspiracy, whether the, all of those pushing the conspiracy theory actually believed it or whether this was a cynical plot. Um, in the case of Trump, I think it's probably almost 100% certain that it was a cynical plot. Um, although there were many others who, who began to go along with it. Um, in the case of Kaczynski, the story is confusing. Um, you know, it may be that he just couldn't bear to believe that his beloved brother was, was murdered accidentally and he wanted a bigger theory. Um, but in both cases, the plot and the conspiracy theory had an important effect on politics. Namely, it appealed to, first of all, to a deep sense of victimization. You know, we as a nation have been fooled. You know, my, my president isn't real. Um, my president has been murdered. Um, it also appealed to people who wanted something different out of politics than they'd been getting up until that time. They wanted politics to be about emotion and identity and grievance and anger. Um, and the conspiracy theories found those people and it gave them something to organize um, those, those emotions around. Um, the conspiracy theories also had a really important effect on what people felt about the societies they, they live in. For if you think about it, if the American president is illegitimate, that means he's not supposed to be president, and yet he is, that must mean something really terrible is happening. That means that the Congress and the White House and the CIA and the FBI and the police and the media and everybody is covering up this terrible story. And they're not letting you know um, that the president is, is illegitimate. And that decreases your trust in all of those institutions. Um, by the same token, what does it mean to say that the president of the country was murdered and it's being hidden? You're not being told the truth about it. Well, that also means that the media, the president, the government, the, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the security services, they're all hiding the truth. They're not telling you what's happening. Um, and therefore your trust in the system, your trust in all these institutions that have been set up to serve you, to, 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 to manage democracy, to manage elections, um, to manage information, these are all lying. 
Um, they're all lying to you. They're all trying to, to hide, hide the truth from you. What does this do? What was the effect of these conspiracy theories? They created deep distrust. So why should anyone have any faith after this in the electoral system? Um, why should they trust fact-based media or science? Um, why should they believe in the goodwill of politicians ever, you know, or trust what the government says if these terrible lies have been told? Um, this distrust, this is the beginning of the end of democracy. Um, when you have people who no longer trust their fellow citizens, who no longer trust the institutions of democracy, who no longer, um, uh, it's, it's not just the media they don't trust, it's the sciences they don't trust, it's the in universities they don't trust, um, any institutions that have knowledge. When they don't trust any of, that, any of that, then why should they believe who won an election? Why should they believe as, as half of the Republican party has, has been telling pollsters for the last few weeks? Why should they believe that, um, that Donald Trump actually lost two weeks ago? Um, you know, or in Poland, you know, why should they believe that um, the government's argument with the European Union um, is really about gay marriage and not about the rule of law. You know, why should they, why should they trust what anybody tells them? Um, this distrust, this feeling that your society has lied to you and that you aren't really part of it and that it's not, and that your leaders haven't told you the truth. Um, this is, as I say, this is the beginning of the end of democracy. And this is the subject of my book, um, The Twilight of Democracy. And my book begins at that point um, and continues from there. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for being part of 5 by 15. What an honor. And the Twilight of Democracy is out now. And I hope that everyone will pick up a copy. But thank you very, very much, because I know you're incredibly busy. So that and that was an extraordinary talk. That is incredibly interesting and thought provoking. And um, we're really honored. So thanks for being here. And now I'm going to introduce Wade Davis, who is joining us from British Columbia. He holds the leadership chair in cultures and ecosystems at risk at the University of British Columbia. And he was with us a few months ago to talk about his new book, which is called Magdalena River of Dreams about the history um, of Columbia. But he's not going to be talking about that subject tonight. He's going to tell us a bit about some of the themes from his viral article that was published in Rolling Stone in the summer. It had over 350 million impressions of people reading this article, which is kind of mind blowing. And the article was really about the impact of the coronavirus on the American era. And we are really pleased and thrilled that you're back with us again, Wade. Um, I know you're so busy, but thank you for being here and over to you. Thank you very much, Daisy. And it, it was wonderful to have Anne's presentation um, before this one because it's so um, uh, so complimentary. Um, you know, the, the haunting thing about the recent American election, as Anne alluded to, was that over 70 million people voted for Donald Trump, including 57% of white Americans. Uh, that was 8 million more than voted for him in 2016, implying that somehow what he had represented or what he had done or not done appealed in, in even greater um, intensity. And equally haunting were the pluralities um, whereby the blue states, with the exception of the, uh, the handful that we are all watching so closely, Georgia and Pennsylvania, North Carolina and Michigan, but the others went with huge pluralities, the blue states to the Democrats by 30 points, the red states to the Republicans by an equal margin. So this chasm in America um, is ongoing and, and as Anne said, has been exasperated by the actions uh, at the moment of the um, outgoing Trump administration. But the article that, I, that, that Daisy referenced uh, came about in a kind of quixotic way. I had been asked to write about COVID, but I didn't really feel I had much new to say um, until I was paddling my kayak around our small island here when I suddenly started thinking that here we were whereby a microorganism 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt had literally commandeered our biology even as it attacked the connectivity and, and community uh, and bonds of reciprocity that are for the human species what teeth and claws represent the tiger and I, I thought that 
COVID wasn't really a story of medicine or public health or morbidity and mortality alone. It was fundamentally a story of culture. So I quickly wrote this essay, sent it to my old friend Jan Wenner, um, and it came out in Rolling Stone and it just hit some kind of nerve. It trended for five weeks, it had 5 million readers on the website itself, over 680 uh, million social media impressions. I mean, my, my Wikipedia site, which had been quite morbid uh, with 140 visits a day, suddenly had 4,000 people searching out um, some information. So it hit this nerve and, and some of the critiques of it uh, almost suggested that I was trying to be uh, deliberately anti-American. Nothing could be further from the truth. I chose to become an American. My wife is an American. My children are raised in the United States. All my education came from the States. My own son-in-law is an active duty, an officer in the U.S. Navy. So the article is more like a love letter to the country. You know, the first step of an intervention is when you hold a mirror to the loved one to try to show them what becomes themselves. Only by seeing that can you take the first step on the path of rehabilitation. You know, pandemics have a way of shifting um, the course of history. The Black Death killed half of Europe and it led to a, a demand for labor which ra raised expectations, which led of course to the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, which overthrew a medieval order that had been in place in Europe for over a thousand years. And I think COVID will be remembered as one of those similar fulcrums in history, a seminal event whose significance only becomes apparent um, down the road. And I'm not talking about the obvious, the fact that patterns of work and, and delivery of entertainment may change. I mean, these are trivial things. We'll adapt to them. Human beings are always dancing with new possibilities for life. Uh, fluidity of memory and our capacity to forget are the most haunting traits of our of our species. They allow us to adapt to any degree of moral or environmental degradation. Um, financial shadow will cast its way for a while, but unless there's a complete collapse in the financial markets, um, the economy of the world will, 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 will continue. But what struck me as most devastating about the COVID uh, pandemic was the absolutely devastating impact it had on the reputation and international standing of the United States of America. You know, Americans awoke in April when 2,000 were dying a day, better than a person every minute of the day, and they found themselves essentially members of a failed state ruled by a dysfunctional government at the head of which was a buffoon of a president who literally was advocating the use of disinfectants to treat a serious pandemic that intellectually he could not begin to understand. And for the first time, as the Irish Times reported, the world's community looked at America with an emotion that they had never experienced before, and that was pity. And as American doctors and nurses eagerly awaited the, uh, the arrival of emergency airlifts of fundamental supplies from China, it's almost as if the hinge of history opened to the Asian century. Now, no empire long endures. Every kingdom is born to die. If you think about it, the 15th century belonged to the Portuguese, the, the 16th to the Spanish, 17th to the Dutch, 18th to the French, 19th to the British. And the British Empire actually reached its greatest geographical extent as late as 1935. But we knew it was in decline. We now know it was in decline by the Diamond Jubilee, and it was certainly bankrupt and bled white by the Great War. And in 1940, America was essentially a demilitarized society. Portugal and Bulgaria had larger armies, and yet within three years, 18 million men and women would serve in uniform as America became, as Rosa promised, the arsenal of democracy. It's extraordinary to think what America achieved. For every five pounds of equipment, the Japanese Empire of the Sun got to a frontline soldier, the Americans got two tons. We spat out Liberty ships at a rate of two a day for four years. The record was a ship built from scratch in 15 hours, in uh, four days, 15 hours and 29 minutes. One American factory, Chrysler's uh, Detroit Arsenal, produced more tanks than the entire German Third Reich. Henry Ford's Willow Run plant um, produced a B-24 Liberator with 1.5 million parts every two hours around the clock. We still had enough supplies to send a million miles of wiring to the Russians, half a million Jeeps, half a million trucks, 
uh, 34 million uniforms. Russian blood beat the Nazis, but Russian soldiers marched into Berlin on boots made in America, 15 million pairs altogether. And in the wake of the war with Europe and Asia in ashes, America created a dominance of the economy, 6% of the population, 50% of the world's economy, producing 93% of the world's automobiles. And that allowed an, a, a, a truce between labor and capital that gave rise to a kind of a golden era of American capitalism and a vibrant uh, working class, the weekend, whereby a man with limited education could look forward to having a family, buying a home, buying a car, and seeing his children follow him or her into the, the, the workplace. Um, and, and it's not that that was some kind of golden age of America. On the contrary, if you were a woman, if you were gay, if you were a person of color, this was a dark period of American history. But in terms of simple economics, uh, it, 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 it was a, a world in which there was more equity. And economically, it resembled Denmark uh, uh, more than it resembled the America of today. Marginal tax rates were over 90%. That didn't mean everybody paid that much, but that was a symbol. The average CEO, like my own father-in-law, who's a C CEO of Bell & Howell Company, would have made 20 times that of a white-collared staffer. Today, that discrepancy would be more like 400 times. Um, and in the wake of the war, America never really stood down. Since 2001, we spent $6 trillion on military adventures. Since the 1970s, China has not gone to war. America has not been at peace. While we've been spending our treasure in foreign engagements, China has built its infrastructure, pouring more cement every three years than America um, did in the 20th century. And this sort of chasm between those who have and those who have not came about in the wake of a war in which we celebrated the individual with iconic intensity. It was sort of the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. It gave for great mobility and individual freedom at the cost of community. And so today we have a situation where the top 1% have $30 trillion of assets, where the bottom half of Americans have more debt than assets. The top three richest Americans control more wealth than the poorest, 160 million. And COVID revealed the, 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 this chasm of American society as, as, as the, the individual became paramount, community slipped away to the point where Americans almost don't even believe in the notion of society, the idea that anyone owes anything to anyone and everybody must scratch to get anything. And the family declined, divorce rates went up dramatically. Only 6% of American homes had grandparents beneath the same roof as grandchildren. Uh, the average youth by the age of 18 has spent two years watching a video screen contributing to an obesity epidemic so severe that the Joint Chiefs of Staff have called it a national security crisis. America consumes two thirds of the world's antipsychotic drugs and the leading cause of mortality for those under 50 is no longer car accidents, but rather opioid uh, addiction. And so the country that somehow had made fighter planes by the hour couldn't make masks or fundamental tools, cotton swabs. The country that defeated polio and smallpox was led by a president advocating the use of disinfectants. A country that celebrated the free flow of in information and the power of education as the core of democracy found itself ranked 45th when it came to press freedom. And I could name you 11 American cities that are not able to graduate even half of their high school classes. And the myths of America, the moral charters of America came called into question. Receiving the huddled masses of the world, well, it was never easy to come as an immigrant to America. Everybody had to claw ashore, but they made landfall. And for Americans to build a wall along the southern border and turn away desperate mothers and separate children from families, that's not an economic and political folly. It's actually an act of treason because treason isn't just when you give secrets to your enemy. It's when you betray the moral charter and foundations of the own people. Freedom has come to mean in the States the right to own a personal arsenal of weaponry, and that trumps even the safety of children. 346 kids and teachers have been shot in schools in the last decade alone. 
And there's almost a sort of sense of no longer a benign purpose. You know, when Americans deny science and they flock to the beaches and convention halls, you know, that's not a gesture of, of freedom or strength. It actually shows the weakness of a people who lack the stoicism to endure the epidemic or the fortitude to defeat it. When 70 million people, as Anne suggested, decide to vote their grievance their, and indulge their own petty concerns, clearly electing someone transparently incapable of doing the job whose only credentials for the job are his willingness to validate their hatreds, uh, to target their enemies real and imagined, what you're actually seeing there is a sign of true decadence because in a vibrant, dynamic democracy, nobody votes their grievances. No one votes their indulgences. They vote for the good of the collective, to vote the good of the country, and indeed the world. And I try to, I try to put this in perspective from a Canadian point of view um, for my friends in the United States in this article. And look, Canada is no perfect place. But we responded to the COVID crisis in a remarkable way, uh, in part because we still have faith in our institutions. You would never have a Canadian politician run against Ottawa. That would be an act of psychotic delusion. Ottawa is who we are. That's the heart of our democracy. And Canadians still have a sense of a certain collective well-being. Our notion of wealth is not the currency accumulated by the lucky few, but rather the strength of social relations and the bonds of reciprocity that link all people in common purpose. We have respect for institutions, our healthcare system in particular, that again is focused on the collective, not the individual, and most assuredly not the private investor who views every hospital bed as a rental property. And on July 30th of, of this summer, when American rates of COVID infection nearly topped 60,000, reaching 59,629, which at the time seemed astronomical, and now it's been dwarfed by local numbers uh, of 160 up to 200,000 a day. On that very day, here in British Columbia, a metropolitan population, an Asian city in Vancouver, dozens of flights coming in from the far east in China every day, three hours up the road from Seattle where the pandemic landed in North America. On the same day that 60,000 cases were announced in the United States, in all of British Columbia, in all of our hospitals, there were just five. And I tried to explain why that might be the case. And I used an analogy uh, uh, or an allegory really of getting your groceries at Safeway. Now, when you get your groceries at Safeway in the United States, almost anywhere, you, we all know there's a kind of a chasm, a social chasm and a racial chasm an economic chasm, uh, an educational chasm, a class chasm between you and the checkout person that is almost unbridgeable. But when you, when you get your groceries at any Safeway in Canada, you don't feel that separation. You may not feel a peer, but you feel part of a bigger community. And for the reason for that is very simple. You know that the checkout clerk knows that you know that they're getting a living wage because of the unions. And you know that they know that probably your kids go to the same neighborhood public school, schools that aren't funded by property taxes in affluent neighbors that benefit the children of the wealthy, but by block grants from the government that give every kid equal access to higher education. And more critically, you know that they know that you know that if their kids get sick, they will get exactly the same medical care as not only your kids, but the prime minister's kids. And those three strands woven together become the social fabric of Canadian social democracy. And let me just uh, close with one personal tale. When my mother was 85 years old, um, she got a headache at 11 o'clock in the morning, living alone in an apartment in the city of Victoria. By two o'clock, she was being prepped for emergency neurosurgeon. And that day her life was saved by a Canadian immigrant. And remember that in Canada, immigration is celebrated. 
half the population of our biggest city, Toronto, is not only of different ethnic origin than the Irish and Scots who settled the country originally, but their half were literally born outside of the country, including the man who saved my mother's life. Now that same day, when my sister and I got to the ICU, the other bed in the unit was occupied by a small girl from a farming Mennonite family from Manitoba. All the family were around them. And my sister and I were thinking, you know, we could have paid for this procedure. My sister's a lawyer, I've done well. But that family in any other jurisdiction, certainly in the States, may well have faced a choice between the well-being of the family and the health and safety and life of the child. And we in Canada simply say, that is not a choice that any citizen should have to make in a proper democratic civilized society. Now, in Canada, in Victoria rather, our fanciest hotel, the Empress, has a policy that any Canadian family member with a, 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 a family member in an intensive care unit at any of the hospitals in the city gets a free room for the night. So after the nurses kicked us all out, the two families roared down to the Empress Hotel together, and we all gathered in a legendary bar called the Bengal Lounge. And of course, the Mennonites don't drink, so I bought them juice or tea or coffee, whatever they wanted. Uh, and my sister had a glass of wine and I had a beer, and then we did a toast. And we didn't toast our loved ones who had survived that day, much as they were in our hearts. And we didn't even toast that genius of an immigrant Indo-Canadian doctor who had saved their lives. We toasted our country because it was our country and our solidarity as a people that allowed this moment to happen. Two families from totally different ends of the political, economic, educational, religious spectrum, geographical spectrum, bound together in grace and gratitude. And for us, that is the perfect expression of our muted patriotism, not um, uh, flag wrapped um, 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 uh, uh, jargon and uh, excitation, but the quiet understanding that we live in a place where our mood and our, uh, uh, and our solidarity is created by the mystique of our landscape, where the weight of the North hovers in the imagination of Canadians, where we live still in a place of consilience and cooperation, not a perfect place, but the kinds of bonds that social democracies has, it's also often said that social democracy will never work in America. And that may well be true, but if so, it's a tremendous indictment because in ways America through the New Deal invented the concept of social democracy. And until this chasm um, is somehow bridged, it's difficult to see America's way forward. And believe me, I, don't look forward to the end of the American century. If and when the torch passes to China uh, with its policies of press repression, attitudes towards the democratic process, attitudes towards minorities, we will certainly be nostalgic for the best years of the American century. Uh, American ideals through Monroe and Madison and Jefferson and Lincoln inspired millions around the world. When Donald Trump said blithely that one day the virus will simply disappear, he had in mind COVID-19, but unfortunately he may well have been talking about the American dream. Wade, thank you so much for being part of 5 by 15 and that extraordinary article um, about the unraveling of um, the American era is available online now and everyone should definitely read that as well as your incredible books, Magdalena River of Dreams, The Wayfinders, Into the Silence, and many, many others. And thank you very, very much for being part of us and for sharing that talk, which complemented so many of the things that we have been hearing about from Marina and from Anne and from Sue. So thank you. And um, we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much, Daisy and Rosie, appreciate it. Bye, Wade. Thank you. And finally this evening, we are very, very, honored to have Maria Konnikova with us. She's joining us from a writer's room where she's adapting um, a new um, program, which is very, very exciting. And she's a best-selling author, she's a journalist, and she's a student of human behavior with a PhD in psychology. Um, 
Maria is also a poker player and a very successful one at that, even though she'd only just started playing poker very recently. Um, but with the help of some of the world's great experts and a huge amount of studying, she um, managed to not only win competitions, but make hundreds of thousands of dollars. And her book all about this is called The Biggest Bluff. And it also gives us a great insight into mastering attention, psychology, and reading other people. And I have to say, I thought it was an incredible book and I passed it on to so many people. Um, it was a New York Times bestseller and we are very delighted to have Maria with us to talk about The Biggest Bluff. Welcome. Thank you so much, Daisy, for that lovely introduction. So I want to start by telling you guys about a moment that happened three years ago when I broke my grandmother's heart. My grandmother is 95 years old. She was born and grew up in the Soviet Union. Uh, she was a school teacher there. And actually I was born in the Soviet Union. Everyone in my family was. I'm generation zero immigrant in the United States. And my grandmother had very, very high hopes for all of her grandchildren. And I'm the youngest of four siblings. And it seemed like everyone was really ready to step up to the plate and to fulfill her, her idea of the American dream for us. My oldest sister, an MD, PhD, she's a neonatologist, she runs a lab, I mean, saving lives, saving babies, Woo! I mean, got, got those degrees out of the way. My other sister, veterinarian, saving animals, wonderful. My brother, engineer at Spotify, figuring out how you listen to music and how to improve your experience one day at a time. And I was doing really well too. I had a great education. I got a PhD in psychology and I was working at the New Yorker and my grandmother was incredibly proud. Until one day, three years ago, when I came home to Boston and informed her that I was going to be a poker player. And I was really, really excited about this. I had been trying to figure out what my next book was going to be for a very long time. And it had all finally come together. I wanted to write about chance and the role that chance plays in our lives and how we can learn to tell the difference about the things we control and the things we can't control. And I'd come across game theory as I was reading about all of these different elements and specifically the father of game theory, John von Neumann. And I learned that he was a poker player, that game theory came out of poker and that John von Neumann, one of the geniuses of the 20th century, not just the father of game theory, but the father of the computer, of the hydrogen bomb, he believed that poker was the perfect game to explore strategic decision-making in life. That if you could solve poker, you'd basically have the answer to everything. You'd be able to figure out how to evaluate risk, how to make decisions in complicated situations where you didn't have all of the information, where there was risk, where there was uncertainty. And these were all big questions that I'd been studying for a long time. And this seemed absolutely perfect. So I was really excited. And I had made this big decision that I was going to leave the New Yorker and embark on a journey to learn the game of poker so that I could write about it and use poker to explore strategic decision-making in life. My grandmother, Baba Anya, was not impressed. She looked at me, her face fell. I've never seen it like that. It was just a look of pure horror, like I'd sold my soul to the devil. And she said, Masha, Masha is my name in Russian. Masha, you're going to be a gambler. And in that moment, I realized that there was going to be a very big disconnect between what I was trying to do and what a lot of the world saw when they saw poker. Now, if I had come to Baba Anya and said, hey, you know what, I'm going to be learning chess, she would have said, good girl, good, good game for a Russian girl, beautiful. But poker, all of a sudden, alarm bells are ringing. She sees me selling my soul and losing all of my money and just completely going insane. How can someone with a PhD, someone who is meant for great things, decide to be a gambler. And 
it made me start wondering, what is it about poker that elicits this reaction from someone like my grandmother? And I realized that it was the heart of the game, the fact that it's played for money. And that people couldn't seem to wrap around their mind around the fact that you could play a game for money and actually still have it teach you meaningful things about decision making. So here's what I ended up telling my Baba Anya and what I ended up learning over the next several years in the game. The fact that there's betting in poker, the fact that you are playing for money, that actually makes it the most powerful teaching tool for teaching statistics, teaching probabilities, teaching how to make decisions in high stakes environment under pressure that I've ever encountered, a much better tool than I've ever encountered in my years in the world of psychology. And here's why. Immanuel Kant, who was not a poker player, but was a philosopher and was a gambler actually, in his critique of pure reason, he writes that betting on an outcome is actually an essential way of correcting people's overconfidence, overinflated opinions, sense of risk in a way that nothing else quite is. He has this wonderful example of a doctor. He says, imagine you go into a doctor's office and the doctor tells you what's wrong with you, gives you a diagnosis. Well, how sure is the doctor? Probably if he's over some threshold and it differs from doctor to doctor, he's going to give you a definitive answer and say, this is what's wrong with you. This is what I'm going to recommend that you do. But now Kant writes, what if you actually take a step back? And what if you tell that doctor, okay, how much money are you willing to bet on your opinion? $10, $100, $1,000? all of a sudden that certainty has to become much more calibrated. You have to stop and ask yourself, wait, am I certain? Should my patient get a second opinion? What should happen in this situation? As soon as you have skin in the game and actually have to put your money where your mouth is, all of a sudden, all of our armchair philosophers and armchair theorists and experts in epidemiology and in politics and in all of these things have to take a step back and say, okay, how sure am I really? In poker, you're not on only constantly calibrating risks, but you're betting on your certainty that your calibration is correct. And so you're forced to think through it. You're forced to think through your reasoning and to think, why do I think this? How sure am I? And how much am I willing to bet on that certainty. And Kant keeps ratcheting up the stakes. He says, you know, would you bet $1,000 on this opinion? 10,000, a million, would you bet your life? He has a quote that really resonated with me right now. If we imagine to ourselves that we have to stake the happiness of our whole life on the truth of any proposition, our judgment drops its air of triumph we take the alarm and discover the actual strength of our belief. Right now, as we're dealing with COVID, as we're living in this unprecedented in anyone's memory pandemic, I think that's such an important thing to remember. And I think that poker has actually made me much better at figuring out those risk reward calculus, those equations that would otherwise be outside of of the realm of the human mind to grasp. Because one thing I've learned from psychology is how bad we are at doing that, how bad we are at understanding probabilities, at evaluating risks, because we don't understand numbers when they're just given to us. 5%, 10%, what does that even mean? Instead, we go based on our experience. Uh, experience. Has this ever happened to me? Do I know someone to whom this has happened? And there's a huge disconnect there. We end up making really bad decisions because we don't understand that 1% is actually a huge risk. We don't understand what exponential growth is. We don't understand any of those scenarios unless we are poker players. So poker has given me one of the single most important tools to living life right now, de dealing with the uncertainty that we're dealing with right now, because every single day, here's what you have to do at the poker table. 
you have to make a decision based on what you know and what you know you don't know. Because poker is like life, a game of incomplete information. I know something, you know something, there's something that we know in common and neither one of us knows what cards are still going to come. And despite that, despite the uncertainty, we have to make a decision, we have to act and we have to act decisively and bet on it. And that makes us make much better, more nuanced decisions as we're evaluating risk. So I actually haven't seen my grandmother since last February when she turned 95 years old. I went to see her and then I went on a trip um, where I was actually traveling to a number of conferences and it was going to culminate with a poker tournament in Los Angeles. So at the end of February, I found myself in New Orleans about to get on a flight to California to play in this huge poker tournament. And right about then, the news of COVID started coming to the United States and the news of the first cases in Los Angeles. And I looked at it and I looked at the numbers and I looked at how the numbers were looking the week before. I looked at the numbers from around the world. I canceled my flight. I went back to New York and I did not basically leave my apartment for the next however many months. And I don't think that that's a decision calculus that I would have been able to make earlier. I wouldn't have understood the implications because the numbers were so low and the risks seemed so low. And yet, because I'd spent several years already immersed in the world of poker, I was able to do that. I was able to come home and I was able to, I think, prevent multiple family members from getting sick. And I was actually very surprised, not surprised, but very impressed to see that out of everyone I knew, the people who understood what was happening first weren't the psychologists, weren't the people with PhDs in decision-making and statistics. They were the poker players. They were the people who lived risk, who bet on risk, who understood risk viscerally and knew how to make those calculations. So I hope that the next time I get to see my Baba Anya, she will give me a big hug and tell me that I haven't sold my soul to the devil after all, and that she's proud of what I have accomplished and of the type of decision maker that I've been able to grow into through my journey in the world of poker. Thank you all so much for listening. Maria, thank you so much for being with us. That was such an extraordinary story and so brilliant to hear you and to be able to have you with us just for these 15 minutes when I know you're incredibly busy doing so many things. That was really wonderful. The Biggest Bluff is out right now and I recommend it incredibly highly. It's so entertaining and you also learn a huge amount about everything around us and the world and the decisions that we make every day. Um, I, I've had a, a great evening this evening. We've had five incredible talks and I wanted to say a big thank you to Norena Hertz, to Sue Black, Anne Applebaum, Way Davis and Maria Konnikova. And, um, and all the books are available and we will share the details um, in, the, in the newsletter that we'll send you tomorrow. And I hope that you will follow up and, um, and get those books and that you will join us again for another 5 by 15. Um, we do have Neil Gaiman and Carla Ravelli next week, which is really, really exciting. So I hope you won't miss that one. And we will open the chat um, if you want to have um, any comments or put any feedback in there, we'd be very grateful. And um, for now, I think that's it. But thank you for joining us this evening. There have been hundreds of people on the call and we are very grateful for your support for 5 by 15. And we wish you all a very good night. Thank you. <laughs>